สวัสดีนะครับท่านผู้ผู้ประชุมท่านนะครับต่อไปเป็นเซสชันที่พูดภาษาอังกฤษนะครับ Sorry, a little bit uh, behind the schedule. Uh, I would like to move on to the next session. It's going to be a drug development part one, inter international experience. Uh, the moderator for this session will be uh, Dr. Nare Kamushai. He's a chief executive officer of Thailand Center of Excellence for Life Science. And we have uh, three speakers for this session. The first speaker is Dr. Brian Summers. He is the CEO and President of the Austrian Nova. The second speaker is Professor Walter Gunsberg. He is the Chairman of the Board and the CTO of Austrian Nova. And the third speaker is Dr. Simone White, Senior Regulatory Consultant of Clinical Network Service. So I'd like to welcome uh, the moderator and the, all of the speakers to the stage. So uh, please, Dr. Norris. To try and give a sense of the story and the, of the journey, because in many cases, when you start out in the lab as a researcher, you think that if you find something which seems to work in a mouse model, um, that you know you're very close to actually getting something which you can bring into a, a human as a product. And actually, it's really just the beginning of the journey. The journey is very long. It goes through some steps that we all know about, like clinical trials. But there's also a lot of things in there, like understanding how to get money together to develop a product, knowing what sort of money you want, trying to think about the ethics of moving the product forward. There's a lot of issues there, especially when we're talking nowadays about stem cells and things like that. 
And then finally, actually, all the development, upscaling, the costs involved, and the regulatory hurdles you have to get through to try and, and go forward. And, and it's been, for us, a long, long journey. It's been, we started this whole process in um, 19... 95, I think. That's right. <laughs> and um, now it's 2014, and we're still not there. So it's a long way. But I think we've learned an awful lot, and we want to share some of what we've learned with you today. Um, so I'm from our clinical network services. I've had quite a few years in regulatory affairs, and in another lifetime, about seven years ago, I actually came across this product as well. We run on a company. Um, at that stage, we were trying to get a clinical trial application uh, through Australia, and although it was relatively painful, I think it's fair to say, uh, but it did actually succeed at the end. Um, but yeah, um, still no more after that. Uh, so hopefully, I'll be able to provide some insight into the requirements, uh, the regulatory requirements for uh, getting your drug onto market from early concept in the lab um, through to actually getting your marketing approval. So please feel free to ask questions uh, throughout this um, presentation and also I'll be around for the next few days so you can come up to me and ask anything you want. Very good. And uh, I'm so, also glad to hear that uh, the experience is also painful in Australia. It's painful here. <laughs> in a good way. Uh, well, coming back to Brian and, and, and Walter, uh, why don't you give a brief overview of your company what is your product exactly, and uh, why did you um, decide to choose the path that you have chosen? Because I understand that in, in the earlier uh, stages, uh, you have lots of possibility with what you discovered, and how come you are here, as you are now, and your experience, which you could share with us. Um, I think uh, you have a lot to share. So maybe if you could, I'll talk to John and Erica. I mean, you know, it's a lot of time. developed a technology where we can put cells inside little beads and implant those beads in the body for therapeutic purposes. And of course this is almost like a mini implant, you let the cells take over the function of cells within your body to try and produce therapeutic effects. How we do this is we take living cells, uh, standard cell lines or primary cells, we mix them with a polymer, and this polymer is a naturally occurring substance, it's cellulose, which is derived from plants, so cellulose sulfate. And when those two are brought together, they can form small beads, porous beads, where the cells are trapped within inside the core of the bead, but there are pores which allow molecules in and out so that the cells can survive within those beads very well. And the living cells then produce the therapeutic molecule which is secreted outside of the bead. So this bead is about 0.7 millimeters in diameter. Uh, after this presentation, if you're interested, we can show you some of the beads. We have some of them with us. Um, they are then implanted into the body where they're then supposed to stay for a long period and produce a therapeutic. Now importantly, these beads cannot let cells of the immune system in there so that cells cannot be rejected. So that means we're looking here for long-term survival of implanted cells producing therapeutic products. So basically what we're doing is, instead of manufacturing a pharmaceutical product in the factory, we're actually taking the factory and putting it inside the body. So what we're doing is we're making the medicine inside the patient's body, and we're, the great advantage of doing this is we control the amount of medicine in a physiological manner. That is to say that the patient itself regulates the amount of medicine it needs and gets. And a good example, of course, is diabetes here. If we have a diabetic, normally and a diabetic will inject themselves with insulin in response to how much food they eat. If they feel they've eaten a lot of sugar, they will take a little more insulin. If they feel they've had less, they will take less. And what we do is we move that 
into the body, we encapsulate cells that make insulin and respond to insulin in blood sugar. So when those cells are injected under the skin, basically as the patient needs insulin because they've eaten more or less, the cells produce more or less insulin. So it's a mini implant. So it's a technology platform. It can be used for many different areas. And some of those areas are outlined on the slide here. The degenerative diseases could be treated with encapsulated cells such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, stroke, infectious diseases, cardiovascular, Walter's already mentioned diabetes, but there's hypercholesterolemia, metabolic diseases, uh, and various other applications. But what we uh, take as our lead product is encapsulated cells for the treatment of uh, tumors, and specifically pancreatic cancer. And in our past, we've already completed a phase one stroke two clinical trial, and then a follow-on phase two clinical trial for patients with pancreatic cancer. So this has been in 27 patients so far, where it's shown safety, but also evidence of efficacy too. And that efficacy data convinced an American company called Nupolix uh, to come on board and to uh, conduct further clinical trials with this encapsulated cell technology. Um, and in three different areas, carrying on with the pancreatic cancer, but also in the area of ascites, so uh, tumor metastases which are formed in the intraperitoneal space, and then the third area that they're interested in is diabetes. Where did you do the phase one? The phase one and phase two studies were done in Germany. Uh, so the phase one stroke two was done in a city called Rostock, which is in northern Germany. The second follow-on trial was done in Munich, Berlin, Bern, and also Rostock. I think uh, you are, this is your product pipeline, so, so you are moving <coughs> to phase 2B, uh, which would be conducted in Australia, as uh, we have invited uh, uh, Simo to. So, what is uh, your uh, experience with uh, applying for this uh, trial in Australia? Well, when we were doing the previous phase two trials, we actually already got approval for a clinical trial in Australia. We went on the CTX route, which is the more complicated, uh, complete disclosure route, I would say, with the TGA. And we worked together with the company in Australia, CNS, to develop that. Um, and we got approval. For reasons which I think would be familiar with every biotech company that's probably been trying to get a product from discovery through to the market, um, and those are financial reasons, the product ran out of steam, unfortunately, before we could do the trial, and we ran out of money. Uh, that was, you know, partly due to the world financial situation, but obviously is always a risk in developing a product. Luckily, as Brian's mentioned, we now have a, we've been able to rejig our company um, business plan, I would say, and now we're working together with an American company that is able to raise the resources to move this forward, and now we're working again in Australia. This time on the CTN route, which is the easier route to go, let's say, because this product has been in clinical trials before in Europe, uh, to get this through into the first clinical trials. And the idea is that the manufacturing for this product will be done in Thailand, and for that reason we're working together with T-cells uh, trying to set up the manufacturing capability here in time. I think that's a very interesting thing for the simple reason that here we're talking about a advanced medicinal product. We're talking about a product which is based on cells, which is being put in capsules and going into patients. It's very different to classical products which may be based on small molecules. And although there may be a lot of experience in small molecule areas, advanced medicinal products all over the world are a new area coming up, and there's less experience in how to regulate them, less experience in how to move those forward. So I think this is quite exciting that we're trying to do this here, and uh, I think this is going to be really a first uh, for this part of the world. So it's exciting. Hi, um, so I'm just mentioning the CTN route in Australia, <coughs> um, especially if it is a very complex biologic, um, and many biologicals go through uh, first in man CTN uh, route where you don't actually have to have um, any evaluation from the TGA. 
you just have to um, give your data pack, say protocol and your IB, and maybe an um, expert report from um, toxicology and pharmacology to your HREC or your um, institutional review board, and then they will approve the trial, and that can be quite rapid, so it could be a, a matter of two or three months from the time that you provide that documentation until you can get into the clinical trial. Um, then the TGA is just notified that the trial is going to start, and if there's any um, like serious adverse events <coughs> then the clinical trial, um, the TGA will have to be notified of those and then just when the trial closes and that's it. So about 95 to 99% of clinical trials in Australia are actually run under the CTE notification rate rather than the more complex and um, yeah, more onerous CTX route which is could more or less be like into an IND in America or a CTA in um, Europe. <coughs> Thank you. Coming back to uh, Ryan and, and Walter, uh, so your discovery research, uh, you have lots of uh, peer-reviewed publications which led you to find this uh, investors. Could you tell that story? I mean, maybe from the point of view of academics turned industrialists, I might say that's the way what we, we've become. We're entrepreneurs and now because we've been trying to come from an academic background. When, as Brian mentioned, when you start this journey, it seems like a very straightforward journey. It seems like you're going to find something in the lab that works, do some animal experiments, and then move forward. And, and so I think the academic part is actually relatively straightforward. You can publish a paper, you get peer-reviewed results, that goes fine. But often these results, and I think speaking as a scientist, I would say often we don't really repeat these things stringently. So what happens in the lab is when you get to work and you get you can peer review, that's fine, you're happy and you move on. And often we don't use statistically relevant groups. So that is one of the things that needs to, we need to go back and check as we move the product forward. Another point which I think people often fail to notice is that the quality of reagents is very important. If you're making monoclonal antibodies or you're making cell lines, there can be big variation between one that's made on one day and one that's made the next day. And in the lab that doesn't really matter because we're looking for something that works. Also in very early trials that doesn't matter. But as you go forward, these become more and more important issues. There's finally the cost of the point of scale and cost. Something that isn't really regarded at all in the lab, but if you want to make a product, it's got to be something that you can sell and that a company eventually can sell at a profit. Otherwise, nobody's going to be interested. And you have to have some ways to scale it up. And if we're talking about advanced medicinal products, which are cell-based products, these are issues which are quite difficult. We all know how to scale up small molecules. We know how to scale up even antibody production now. But really, do we know how to scale up cell-based products in a very effective way? Mainly, it just means having a lot of laminar flows and people working, instead of having three technicians working, they're having 50 technicians. But that's not really scale up. So these are issues which I think are things that we discuss. Yeah, it's very important to have a consistent product and a reproducible product. And that, of course, that's very hard as Walter well, just said, with cells as a therapeutic. So you have to have very robust assays. You have to be able to show that the cells will make the same amount of enzyme or insulin on day one as day 51 or whatever. So you need very robust assays that uh, show reproducibility to do that. And there are also big variation between from cells to cell, from cell line, one cell line. To right, one. right. I mean, for instance, the product we're making now, we, we, we talk about clonal cell products, and, and all the regulators want to see real good data on clon clonality, that you've actually got one cell in there, it's very well characterized, and it will go forward. If you can't characterize the cell, it's a black box. If you can't show that the cell is the same now, tomorrow, in six months' time, and at the end of the process, that won't fly with the regulators. You won't get approval. The problem is that cells are variable things, so that as you culture them, they can change. So you have to show cell stability, and that is a tremendous challenge. And it takes an awful lot of time because it means cloning those cells, doing a lot of assays, subcloning the clones, sub subcloning the subclones and all the time assaying and showing stability over an excess of cell <coughs> divisions compared to what your process is. Yeah. Well, what, what kind of expertise do you have on your team? So what we've been doing is we've, we've done a lot of this cell cloning work and, and cell biology work 
we, we try to do the subclones, we assay the cells, we look at the insertion sites, we check that the insertion sites are the same almost, so we really have a clone. We sequence the insertion sites, we look at whether the production of the biological is affected by the cell cycle, by stress that the cell might be put to. These are all things that one has to regulate and keep under control. But we're a very small team, so we're about 10 people in total, so we do some of this work in-house ourselves, but we can't do all of it in-house, and so we rely very much on partners that help us in various areas. So we go to contract manufacturers, contract research organizations, and of course that's all very costly, but in the long term it's maybe the quickest and the best way to go and cost-effective way to go, because if you have a huge team of 100 people, um, you're not gonna keep them uh, occupied for all of their time just doing these various steps. So even with our clinical trial organization, we mentioned clinical network services in Australia is one of our partners. Uh, we've had another partner for, for cloning of the cells and we'll have the cells made into a master cell bank and a working cell bank, which is a bankable source of cells which are well characterized, uh, adventitious agent free. That will all be done by a partner. And then one of those vials will be taken, it will be thawed, it will be grown, the cells will be grown, and then they'll be encapsulated, and we'll have made then a product which we will freeze away, store, and ship for the clinical trials. I think that brings us probably to the next point, which is how do you finance all these things? So, I mean, to me, that is one of the biggest questions in biotech, is how do you get the money to actually move a product forward? And obviously, the first thing people think of is venture capital, VCs, they'll come in and they'll finance your company. But at the same time, they'll take your company away from you. And I think that is something which is something one really has to think about deeply, whether you really want to go down this route. If you get a venture capitalist on board, and they, they will only come in very early, and they will demand a huge slice of the cake. In other words, they will basically take over control of the company. And the reason they do that is because they calculate a very low success ratio. So they'll only calculate that one in 10 companies actually makes it. But you as the founder want to make sure that you are that one company that makes it. Therefore you want to make sure that you keep control and go through. They don't care. As long as one of their 10 companies goes to the end, that's, they're, they're happy. So you're going to give up a lot of control. And they'll come in and tell you they know how to better run a biotech company than you do. And Maybe in some areas they do, but certainly in other areas they don't. Uh, and there have been plenty of companies that I've been involved with, I think Brian's been involved with, which we've seen that the investors have either killed the company or slowed the progress of the company towards its goal down tremendously. Because their only focus is making money. They don't care at the end of the day whether you have a product which helps patients or comes anywhere. They don't care how they make money, they just want to make money. So I think one has to think very carefully about that. But the upside to having a venture capitalist is on board is that you have a seal of approval somehow. So it's still seen as being quite important to have venture capital on board, simply because you've got people behind you who've got a lot of business acumen, as what is just said, and will make sure that you try and target an addressable uh, need and try and make money out of it targeting that addressable need. I mean, scientists are probably the worst businessmen. Um, and I mean, I was a scientist, a real, real scientist once upon a time, actually standing in the lab and doing things. I've become kind of a quasi-scientist now. I know roughly what's going on in the lab, but they, they throw me out of the lab if I come and try and do anything there. I've become more of a businessman over the years, and so has Brian, I think, because we've realized what are the important issues in growing a company. So if you've never done it before, you definitely need some business acumen to help. But it can, venture capital is a high cost. The other way of doing it, of course, is to find what we call angel investors or high net worth individuals, which are rich people, basically, who are willing to put their money into the company. They usually don't demand so much of the company. They are very focused on making that company successful. So they, they, they are really interested in helping the company go along. And they will take less level of control. If you're very lucky as well, they may even understand your area of business and they may be able to coach or advise you on certain issues. Yeah. So, so that is something that our company has done. <coughs> we've been through it all. We've had venture capitalists, we've had, um, we've had investors, we've had high net worth individuals. And at the moment we have a mixture of private 
private individuals and, and high net worth individuals. And that's a very comfortable mixture because they are interested in in sharing our vision to make something out of the company and also to make a medical product. And I'll come back to that later in terms of the ethics behind doing it that, but I think that's that's really important. But I guess most people start off very small with very little amounts of money, maybe even running the project alongside their normal lab work and try and find investment from there. And of course there it's very useful if you have some sort of government startup support. I'm not sure whether that really exists in Thailand. I don't think it does. It doesn't exist in Singapore. It used to exist in Austria, way back when we started our company. We got 60,000 euros, um, strings free, so it wasn't attached to any milestones, any use of the funds. You could use it for whatever you wanted. You could employ a technician to pursue whatever your product was. You could use it to buy a piece of lab equipment that was absolutely essential for what you wanted to do as a startup company. And that sort of money would be valuable, I think, to help and persuade people to start up their own companies. Nowadays, one of the more interesting ways of moving a company forward is this idea of crowdfunding. And there are a few companies out there that have actually raised money through crowdfunding which means going basically on the internet, selling your idea and getting people to buy in. And that's a very interesting way forward, I think. And, and in Europe, we also have a, a similar, it's not quite the same, but another company that's been extremely successful and is already in, in clinical trials, having done a kind of cross between a crowdfunding and a sort of being a public company. It's a sort of way forward. But I think that the, really the most important aspect that people have to bear in mind, and this would be my message, it's not necessarily the message that VCs will give you, VCs will say, focus on the product. It's a big return when you get that product to market and don't do anything else on the way. It's very much a European, American type thinking. In Asia, I think we think a little differently. We think, where can we make money? Let's make money where we can, and let's use that money to grow our business. And that's the sort of thinking I would subscribe to. That is to try and find early, early revenue. So what we've tried to do in our company is to find early streams of revenue. So we've had strategic choice investors. We're focusing on rapid cash flow generation. That seems very important. Because once you've got enough cash flow in the company to actually finance your activities, you're independent of all these influences which might negatively affect your company. So we've tried to do that in terms of our business model, in terms that we've gone away from the idea of looking for one long-term goal, making one big product which is going to make us all millionaires overnight, to something that can we find ways to generate early revenue which will finance our company and grow our company slowly but in a more classical way as a, with a solid footing. And that model may fit better to the way we do business in Asia, all of us, I think. So that's probably a good one. Um, so now you have Lugalik as your investor. No, no, Lugalik is a customer. Okay. So what we've tried to do is we've, we've, we've tried to sell our technology as a technology platform. And so we have a number of customers who each pay us to use our technology, and they also pay us to develop the products for them. So a lot of these companies that we have as customers are virtual companies. They have virtually no staff, but they're generating money and cash by going on the stock market or making a good story. And then they ask us, they contract us to actually then make the product, to, to develop the product. So we're the back end. We have a low public profile, let's say, in terms of fundraising, but we're getting paid by a number of sources. And in the long term, if that strategy works out, our company will sell to one of our customers because they'll need to buy us because they'll need our technology. So it'll be, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting strategy. It gives us early yeah. cash and gives us a independence. So we're not actually told what to do by our customers. You know, we can still choose and pick and choose. But our customers are very important to us. They're, they're like partners helping develop the company. It's more like this in my own particularly with Newbrix, I think it's our first major customer. They are a minority shareholder in our company, but as well as the same, they don't really tell us who we can work with and who we can't work with. They have clear rights to the oncology, they have clear rights to the diabetes, but we are free to operate with whomever we like in all the other areas, including stem cells, antibodies, uh, probiotic bacteria even. And, and, and 
in that whole revenue side, I think the most important thing that Brian and I have learned is to cut costs at every possible way. VCs, if you go with VCs, they will tend to follow the, the sort of supernova approach. Spend a lot of money very quickly, have a huge, big flash, make people interested in you, and hope that some of it sticks and you go forward. But if you fail, you fail. You've lost. What we try and do is we try to conserve the money, focus on a low burn rate. We minimize expenditure on, on capex, which you can't, that means we don't want to say build buildings or stuff which we can't take with us. Um, we try to find cost-effective solutions. Thailand, I think, has a great, great infrastructure, has great value as a, as a place for cost-effective manufacturing, but not for, just for big companies. We've talked about this, uh, I think, as well. It, there's not such a focus on big farm companies, but for all these small companies like ours, we are looking for homes like Thailand, which would offer us the possibility to bring our products forward with our very limited budget. And we'll, we at the center will bring brand new uh, technologies to the country. So I think it could be a very good sim symbiosis. We try to virtualize all our functions. Our company is very small, as Brian said, only 10 people. And we try to outsource as much as we can. So this is the management of our company. There's actually three people in our management. That is Brian, myself, and our operations director in Singapore. And everything else, our sales, our finance, all the other parts of our company are virtualized out. They're outside, but they're people who are experienced to help drive the company forward. So that's very impressive how you strategically choose uh, your partners, your uh, investors, and now you have a product which is about ready. Could you tell more about the, the development of maybe <coughs> of Brian? Yeah, I mean, we started out as a small company. We showed, showed in some lab studies that we could encapsulate our cells in plant and, and treat tumors that were in the mice. And then from that, we went through the whole route of being able to make, at that time, a GLP uh, cell line and then encapsulate that and implanted into patients in those first um, clinical trials. To do that, of course, and we've said this already, that we needed to have reproducibility. We needed to know that every batch of the capsules would have exactly the same number of cells, the same viability of the cells, the same enzymatic activity of the cells within a range, plus minus, say, 5%. How many cells, <coughs> typically, how many cells per box? Typically, in one of those 0.7 millimeter um, capsules, diameter uh, capsules is about 10,000 um, cells. Uh, to get this, the technology is really easy. I mean, you just mix the cells with the cellulose, you make droplets, they harden from outside, and you have the cells inside. But to make the same number of cells, make the process of the same number of cells are in the capsule every time you do it was extremely difficult for us. So the process itself took 10 minutes, but to get that under control took us two years. So yeah, so, so so there are a lot of issues of scale up which aren't immediately obvious until you try and do it. So we're developing our own bioreactors. We we have companies building bioreactors for us, completely new types of bioreactor. We have everything based upon a, a disposable system, so we don't have any questions of, of reusing things or having to check that they're sterile. We try to minimize risk. Those are all issues in the development phase. What we see from the other side of the table is if we fail along that pathway for whatever reason, and mainly the reason is the problem <coughs> cost, then you have a problem. And that happened to us in our previous history that we, we came forward with our Australian friends looking after our clinical trials. We, we got permission to go into the clinical trials. We even manufactured the GMP batches in our facility in Frankfurt. And then our investors didn't come up with the rest of the money. So they, they only paid a, a quarter of the amount of money they actually originally promised to pay us. At that point, basically, there was no way forward. And the interesting thing is that, depending on which culture you're in, that really affects your company's potential for, let's say, recovery. So um, the culture in America, I think, is that failure teaches you lessons. So people who've gone through failure, whatever that failure might be, 
When they do go to do the same thing the second time, they've learned through those failures and they'll do it better next time. So in America, I think there's a, if you look also in politics and in, in general, I think, people who are successful have often been through a few rounds where they were not successful and then finally have made it to be successful. And people think that's, that's sort of the American way. We try and try again until we get there. In Europe, it's completely different. Europeans have no tolerance, zero tolerance for failure. If you fail, you're gone. Nobody wants to talk to you. And there's a, there's a great difference. And, and I personally subscribe to the American way because I think you learn through doing. So the more times you do things, the more you learn. If you're intelligent, you take your failures on board and you try to learn from them and try to do better. And I think we've tried to do that. So that's why we've been very cautious in who our investors are because of our bad experience in the past. We've changed our manufacturing because in the past we used glass and steel, uh, a manufacturing process which was sterilizable, which was re reusable. We had problems with the sterilization, with the reusing, that sometimes the sterilization, especially with our process, was not perfect. So we had contaminations. We learned from that not to do it that way and to go to complete disposable process. So I think you can learn a lot from your past failures, let's say, and that can help to your future success. So that, I think, is an important message I would say. So that <coughs> is perhaps one of your company's value, or maybe yourselves, of you know, uh, not giving up, and uh, all the employees in your companies, they also subscribe to this uh, spirit, I believe. Yeah, I think we're very fortunate in our employees. We have a very young company um, that we are very, very enthusiastic and very motivated people who also think for themselves. I think that's one of the things we try to encourage is that everybody is just as important as the next. It's a very, it, obviously we have to take ultimate responsibility for how the company goes, but at the same time we let our employees come up with ideas, try to develop things on their own, give them a lot of freedom to, to develop their areas, and, and encourage them, and that's the way it goes forward. And the interesting thing is we are moving forward in a space where normally you would employ very expensive people who have had a lot of experience before. We take those people as consultants where we need them, but we try to do as much as possible in-house and to learn from those people. Also, I hear that you're also working with a Thai company in developing a new product. Uh, would you be able to talk a little bit about that? It's still I don't know whether I can mention any names. I'm actually working with two companies, but it's a very interesting area of probiotic and bacteria. So we found almost serendipitously that when we encapsulate probiotic bacteria in these beads, uh, that we can protect them from the harmful effects of low pH. And of course, probiotics are bacteria that are found in uh, health food products, in yogurts, uh, other sort of drinks. Uh, that's have to go through uh, this low pH by going through the stomach. And that's the major issue that, that most producers of these foods face, that the probiotic bacteria, once they're exposed to the low pH in the stomach, are inactivated. So like 99.999% die. So very few probiotic bacteria make it into the small intestine where they're supposed to be having their beneficial effect. So we believe that our encapsulation technology can address this by protecting the probiotic bacteria from that low pH and getting them delivered in high numbers to the small intestine where they're required. And that's something that's ongoing and that has been tested together with two potential partners here in Thailand. Of course, Thailand is the ideal place to do this in Southeast Asia because you have a very good um, food, animal food, also human food market. Uh, I believe that Yakult is one of the biggest selling products uh, here in Thailand compared to other Southeast Asian nations. So it would be really good for us that it would come to fruition to a final product that's on the market. That's very good to hear. Um, well, yes, I think uh, we have, we are approaching uh, uh, lunchtime, so I would like to uh, go to the part where we talk about the regulators, uh, and uh, this is where I think Simone so is very important. Uh, uh, yes, so um, I was approached with this project. Um, I mentioned that uh, at the stage that it's at at the moment, you have an open IND, 
and uh, so the um, FDA allowed for a number of different um, meetings during the process up to the stage of regulation. Um, so Interphase 1 and Interphase 2 and also pre-NDA or pre-PI meetings. Um, I don't actually have a few slides that gave a bit of an overall process. So. <coughs>
drugs, like especially invasive drugs, where we're going to maybe drill a hole into someone's head and insert a device and put some stem cells in there, we're obviously not going to do that on healthy volunteers, and we do it on um, patients. So approximately 10 to 30 subjects. And um, the aim of the phase one is to establish the pharmacokinetic properties, so what the body is doing to the drug, how it's metabolising and it's, it is moving it. And phase one can also um, look at dose range findings, so um, different doses, trying to find out how the dose affects the pharmacokinetics and perhaps, um, you know, if by increasing the dose it becomes um, slightly toxic or less safe. But the dose will be established from the um, non clinical studies with the animals. Just some considerations in Australia, I know that we've um, touched on these already. Uh, going into phase one in Australia, uh, it's generally fast and pragmatic regulatory process, and I really do, as the present company, want to say generally, um, because uh, almost all trials are run under the clinical trial notification scheme, and we have some quite complex biologicals that are going first in there and under that scheme, with just review from the Institutional Review Board and um, the TGO don't see it at all. Um, that's not stopping them from actually um, forcing it through the CTX scheme if they don't feel comfortable reviewing it. As mentioned, um, the, it's not necessarily GMP material for first in human, it can be GMP-like, although a lot of contract manufacturing organisations aren't um, comfortable with perhaps the legal implications <coughs> of the definition of GMP-like. Um, just to give Australia another plug, it's, uh, they offer attractive um, tax incentives for companies who develop products in Australia. So that's 40, I think at the moment it's 43.5% tax refund on your investment. It's probably still over there and it's just as economical with developing in Thailand. But. And uh, one, one great thing about performing a first in man in Australia and getting into clinic quickly is you get some data from uh, Western population which can help support um, opening a USIND. So yeah, we, uh, I just talked about the CTN scheme before. Uh, there's one situation where you can't go into a CTN um, and this happens more often than you probably think is that companies go to the USA and they go and get their um, apply for their IND and uh, the the FDA say no, we don't really want, we don't think their IND is you know done as appropriate. So they put them on clinical hold and they go, hey, I'll just go to Australia because they don't even evaluate the data. But if you're on clinical hold, you can't go into um, trials in Australia. Yeah. Mm. And just, uh, there are special cases, if you've got a genetically modified organism, you need an additional license from the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator. And the type of license just depends on the type of risk um, to other human beings in the environment, whether it's the environment's going to be exposed or whether that can be easily contained. Uh, these license applications can take a while, um, but they can be run in parallel to uh, the other processes, whether um, CTN with the human research ethics review or um, with the actual CTX evaluation process, which is actually supposed to only take 50 days in total. And just a few thoughts about the US. Oops, I'm trigger happy. Okay. So we know that an IND, you need that for entry into clinical trials in the US, and they'll accept foreign data uh, as long as it's translated and um, GMP-like material commencement of the trial. So I think it's um, 21 CFR 323, I can't remember the exact number, but it, it talks about um, what you need to be included in the IND and it talks about um, being able to identify your drug product and control it, but it doesn't say it has to be GMP. So you obviously need an appropriate preclinical package um, as discussed in the second slide, on the second slide, the first slide. And if you're a non-US company, you'll have to have a US agent. And that can typically be, um, it can actually be just one person working as a regulatory consultant, and they'll be the person that facilitates um, any interaction between the company and the FDA. So we recommend uh, for foreign companies, companies, when I say foreign, any company that's not the of the country that you're going into, um, 
to get a fresh set of eyes on your developmental package. So you may think, and many companies think, that there's very ambitious um, Gantt charts with, you know, do their non-clinical uh, work in six months and then they're going to do phase one clinical trial in three months. You know, in three years' time they're going to have it all done. Um, but if you can get a sense check on people who know the industry, um, and we call it a gap analysis often, we look at all of uh, the information that you have and um, all of the studies that you have planned and say, well, you don't really need to do those additional 200 laboratory studies, they're not going to add any value, but you do need to do these studies and um, help design um, or help the study design. So um, an independent um, um, consultants like ourselves can do that kind of thing. Uh, so with the IND process, you can actually uh, request the pre-IND meeting. So that's the one free meeting that you get before you get your IND. Um, and, or you could request a pre, what they call a pre pre IND meeting. So if you're having a bit of trouble with a certain aspect of your non clinical development program, and we've just recently had a meeting and we requested a pre pre IND meeting. A client was having a problem with um, nanoparticles in their product accumulating in lymph nodes, and so we wanted help from the agency um, to try and work out how we could maybe work through their protocol to. Um, to help work out this result. But uh, when we uh, sent in the request for this pre pre IND meeting, which would be free as well, they said, no, this is a pre IND meeting. You know, they, they don't want to keep having these free meetings. Um, and so they needed the protocol and they wanted to know how the study was going to look. Um, and we went through all that with them. And it actually, the outcome was uh, pretty successful. And they actually offer to help with the protocol design of the study when we had the problem with the accumulation of the nanoparticles. So having a, an IND meeting um, really does help to get the FDA's buy into the program and they are really helpful. They will give spontaneous um, help with your protocols and uh, until you actually get your IND it's actually quite a um, hefty annual fee I think for the IND itself but they do um, give you four um, free meetings throughout the process. Oops. Yeah. So yeah, basically once, you, once you've um, submitted all your IND documentation, and that's all on the, uh, quite easily find on the website, um, of, of course go and get external help if you need help um, interpreting any of the guidance or any of the documentation required. Uh, once this is submitted, uh, you, just, you wait for 30 days and you hope that you don't hear anything, because if you hear nothing, then you can go ahead with your trial, it's not an actual approval. Um, but if there is an objection, then you get put on clinical hold and uh, have to um, work out with the um, FDA how you can get off that hold. So that's just a few uh, bits and pieces uh, with the um, FDA and the TGA. And thank you very much, and please come and chat to me if you want to know uh, about anything regulatory in the um, Europe uh, FDA in Australia. Yes, thank you very much, Simone, uh, for showing this uh, the picture of the process. Uh, uh, Simone will be with us uh, for, for today and tomorrow, so I believe that there are very many interesting points in her talk that uh, you might want to come and ask, her, which you can do that later. Uh, now, let me uh, come back to Austria Nova, and uh, just like to ask your 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 real experience. Given the case of, of your company, what are when it comes to the, the regulators? Yeah, I think I think from Simone's talk and also from our experience and from the discussions I've had with regulators, we've we've been to the EMA in Europe, we've been to the FDA in America, we've been to the TGA in Australia, we've been to the HSA in Singapore. Um, and our experience with these regulators is that they are working with us actively to try to help us develop the product. So I gave a, I, I have a funny story to tell. Maybe I can remember my funny story. Nothing to do with our company here, but I, I was an advisor to a Bavarian company. And the Bavarian company was making bispecific antibodies. But they were making the bispecific antibodies in cows in the blood of cows. So our challenge was to set up a GMP production unit 
where we could bring the cow in, the live cow, we could form a, do a apheresis <coughs> on their blood, remove basically the bispecific antibodies, and then put the cow back out on the field till the next time it came back in the GMP. And it had to stand in the GMP for something like two to three hours whilst this process was being gone through. Now, I'm sure you all know that cows are not the cleanest of animals, and to bring a cow into a GMP lab or a GMP facility is quite technically difficult. And we managed to set up the first GMP, approved GMP unit in Germany, where you could actually have cows standing in your GMP and in producing by specific antibodies. That was a big challenge. We worked together with the regulators, and they were very, very helpful to try and design around that process exactly what we needed. And the same thing when we talk about clinical trials. When we went to the EMA, the, clinic, the people sat together with us, worked out our clinical trial protocol with us. And the same thing with the experience we've had with the TGI. And I think that for me is where I would like to see regulators. I want to see them as sitting on the same side of the table as us, often moving into new territory, because we're talking about advanced medicinal products here, cell therapy products. There's very little experience. So basically, we have to work together to try and develop that experience between us. And we're all on the same side. We're all trying to make a product which is safe, which is going to move rapidly forward into patients, with minimal risk to the product of the patient. And so, if I had a, you know, if I had a, if I had a magic wand and I could change everything, I would say that's what I would really love to see in every country that that, that we could get a, a sitting together with the regulator with the small companies like ours that are developing new things and really trying to develop together the best way forward, specifically for each product. It's not a one solution for everything. It's a very specific solution for each product. Yes, we want to just say this. Uh, using, I mean, going to the supranational regulators. I think for his cow story, he probably went to the Paul Ehrlich, which is the German specific regulator. They're particularly good at giving advice. Um, wearing another hat, I'm a consultant for another Southeast Asian company who is trying to develop a vaccine uh, using virus like particles. So it's quite novel, it's quite new technology. Very interesting, actually, what they're doing. But they had issues about manufacturing. They had issues about tox studies. So they requested a meeting with the Paul Ehrlich, and uh, it's a very formal process with a very clearly defined pathway and timelines. And that meeting went ahead with eight experts uh, from the Paul Ehrlich, who then provided valuable input into how the manufacturing testing, uh, uh, what would be expected there was, should be done. Also giving a little bit of ex their experience talking, obviously they talked to many other companies developing vaccines. So they can tell a little bit without revealing who the companies are, what other com companies had to go through to be able to do their manufacturing. It's a very useful procedure, I think. Well, uh, you have started your production facility here at the Thailand Science Park, and uh, you're now dealing with the Thai FDA. So, well, we have the uh, uh, Secretary General of the Thai FDA here, so uh, <laughs> you can take your uh, message uh, about the, the part about bringing the cow into the gym. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, our, our product is a lot easier than that. <laughs> <laughs> so we really have the challenges. Yes, I, I can assure that it's much easier. Uh, well, we are coming to the last part, and the time is up, so I would like to ask you. Uh, for, for Walter and Brian, what do you foresee for the future of your company? Uh, how far would you like to go? What, what is your exit strategy, if there's any? And also, the, the second question is about your take home message to uh, our Thai entrepreneurs here, uh, because you have the, the whole experience. Please. I think we're very fortunate that we have a technology platform company. Um, they used to be in, and they were, you couldn't even talk about technology platforms. People would just say, we want to hear about products. Uh, but I think our technology platform can be very valuable in many different areas, even areas we haven't even anticipated. So we'll talk about our technology at scientific meetings, and invariably we'll get someone come up to us afterwards and say, have you thought about using cell encapsulation to do this or to do that, or in this disease or that disease? 
So, so there's a lot that can be done with the technology. Uh, I think we're very fortunate that we've um, met up with our American partners. Uh, this has finally helped us to generate some cash within the company. Our aim is to attract new partners, and we are constantly in discussions with new partners. We are doing a lot of pilot studies with different biotech companies in all sorts of different areas. Um, it can be at the level where we're just encapsulating to the level that we are co-developing a product together. Um, our future exit, I think, will be probably a trade sale. Probably a company will see the power of the technology and its use in many different areas. Um, I don't want to be. Um, I'd, I'd like to stay modest, but I think it's akin to monoclonal antibodies, this technology, but it has such a broad and applicable use. Um, but there may be areas where, like probiotic bacteria, bacteria or encapsulation probiotic bacteria, where that can be spun up as a separate company. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with Brian, but, and, I, and I would say, if my message is to entrepreneurs, I would say, try really to do your best to move the product forward. Concentrate on the cash flow. Control your cash flow at all times because cash is king. You have to keep, once you lose, we have no more cash, basically you're dead. So for me, cash is the most important thing, but never give away the control of your company to people who are just, just trying to make it a quick buck. Um, unfortunately, there are many people out there who prey on, on scientists and people and offer them the world, but actually just want to make a quick buck. At the same time, be guided by ethics. To my mind, that is an incredibly important thing. We tend to have forgotten, I think, over the last 10, 20 years, as the new economy has taken over, that we're not. You know, what we used to do is build companies with sustainability, which would move for the future. We'd build a company which would be there for our kids and their kids. We've been moving, and we've lost that. We're building companies quickly. If it doesn't make quick money, then we let the company drop. And in that process, we're losing some really valuable products. I was, a, I was involved in trying to bring a, a product for a rare form of kidney cancer to the market in Europe with the EMA. I was in the final, I was an expert for the final uh, discussions with the EMA. And purely because the company, it wasn't our company, but the company that I was working for at that time, were not able to show a mechanism of action because it was an immunological product, we didn't get marketing authorization and we didn't even get a tentative or, or, or temporary provisional marketing authorization. And that killed the company and basically that product was lost. Now to my mind that was a great shame and that was a big mistake on the part of the EMA, I, I honestly think so, uh, because it took away a potential product from, from patients. At the same time there are other companies I've been involved with where the investors didn't get a return quick enough, didn't see the big picture, and then just killed the company. Again, losing some valuable products. So that is, to me, ethically totally unacceptable. And something which, if we believe we have something, we have to try and build that company in a sustainable manner for the future. And there I think you know, we could all work together, all of us, regulators, scientists, developers, to kind of develop, use a code of ethics which says, you know, you know, money is necessary. Yes, we want to make some money for our investors, obviously, but ultimately we're in this for the patients. And I think that's something we should always bear in mind. Yes, you show, you have perseverance and you've shown us how much you love your company, apart from learning the science. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. It has been a very, very productive session, I would say. Uh, thank you, Brian, Walter, and Simon for joining us and sharing with us with, uh, all your experience and knowledge. Thank you. Professor Dr. Rupani Tirat in the next room, the Lotus Room. Okay.